All right, time to check out all the extra features. It's extras. I call it extras here. Way to make it easy. Okay. Many of us dream of making video games for a living. How can you make the dream a reality? How can you learn the skills you'll need to win a job on a development team? Can taking courses in video game development help? First, we asked two executives who hire development teams what you're going to be up against. In hiring the 22 artists for the team, um, we probably looked at over a couple hundred uh, sort of resumes, demos, um, websites, and things. But last year there were 2,000 uh, formal applications for 60 intern slots. These are tough odds. What can help you beat them? More and more colleges and schools are now offering courses oh my God, the in video game development. But a degree from one of those schools can be quite an investment of time and money. How much will those courses help? For some students at some schools, it's just the edge they need. Students now are going through school, not only are they playing games in their spare time, but they're building game-like assets in art school. They're building game programs as thesis project in computer science. And they're showing up on our doorstep ready to make dramatic immediate impact and ready to be leaders within about three years of one of these $10 million projects. $10 million projects. At the Art Institute of California at San Francisco, the game program includes courses like game design, game prototyping, scripting, oh. math, So logic, it's just an advertisement for a school. At Cogswell Polytechnical, also near San Francisco, some or of the unique few, exercises I don't know. push your creativity to another level. For example, to focus on 3D character development, these students made sculptures of themselves as animals. Looks just like him. I was shocked to learn that in order to draw, um, you go through what is mostly an anatomy class. You have to learn the bone structure of a human, and the muscle structure, and then you learn kind of the rendering of the details, like the hair and everything. So it takes a lot of work. Students discover what a nightmare it is to make a game. How much time and energy and commitment, how much soul-searching evenings when you have to face getting your character into work inside the game engine or going home to get two hours sleep before your classes start again the next morning. The game art design program originated from uh, talking to the industry and get, uh, getting feedback from them that they were looking for students that had an understanding of the game process and strong teamwork. And then uh, show her full, then she burps, then she covers her mouth. It's crucial to get experience working in a team environment. To work by yourself at home is an entire I wonder how many of these people ended up actually working in, in the industry. Along with everybody. Like this was and made more than 20 years ago. Or, oh, I wait, lines. this is issue I don't know, it's about 20 years ago, let's say 20 years ago. People get together and they focus on what they're doing and the energy, the synergy just starts to take over. So these people would still be working in the industry if they got into it days and didn't and like get burnt out or anything. Each other. Like, Come on, just a few more hours, you can do it, you can finish it. What we've found works best is to go to places that have strong computer graphics programs and strong uh, CS programs and work with the professors and they can start identifying students who have an aptitude but also motivation, and then we can kind of set up a pipeline. I had people from Electronic Arts come down and give a presentation on how to do demo reels. Is that John Romero a second ago? Into the presentation of what the game club I was looking away. I... They were just agog. They sat down literally and said, how the hell did you do this guy? This is fantastic. And they went one by one to all the students. So they finally got up to Ashley and they said, Ashley, you've done a great job with these people. We want you to apply for an internship over at Electronic Arts. And he said, uh, well, I don't think my artwork's that good. They said, the hell with artwork, we want you to be a producer. That was probably the most important thing they were looking for, is someone that was able to um, drive a project from beginning to completion. You know, motivating, getting together with a group of people, and driving a project. 
To find talent for his art team, Julian Lau helped teach a course at San Francisco's Academy nice hair, of Art, buddy. where two students distinguished themselves from the rest of the class and now work for him. One, one of our animators that we hired from a game school was um, Jacob Patrick. And one of the great things about looking at his animations and things that he learned and what he did at school was his attention to detail, the movement of the characters, the weight behind it, whether it was uh, moving a heavy object, you know, picking up something, running. From the Sony animation class, I, as well as the other students, learned the importance of using reference. What they were looking for was to be able to find realistic human movement. Many of us the mirror there isn't a vanity thing. The mirror is because he is like looking at himself while moving his arms or whatever and trying to use that as a base for his animations. By just submitting his demo reel. And he was very persistent. And we took a look at his reel and everything and really liked what we saw. It brought him in. Whoever is going to hire you needs to see how you model. It's not just a final object is how you created it, that it's important, and the steps, and the time you took, uh, the details. Even if you take development courses, the chances of actually getting a job on a real team are slim. We ask how to improve your odds. Identify your talent. So whoever you are, whatever you want to do, research the industry, understand exactly what it is you want to do. Do you want to be a modeler? Do you want to be a coder? Find out exactly what you want to do, where your talent lies, and then focus on that. What correlates well with success is the ability to learn. People who can process negative and positive learning and people who can communicate and listen. It's a to long video. Holy shit. Valuable. Will you be one of the next generation of game developers? Apparently How not. You make your mark on video games. In 2010, the platforms we create for are going to be 100 to 150 times as powerful as the PlayStation 2. That is just about unimaginable. Kids coming out of school today will all have the flexibility to imagine it. They've got, they've grown up interacting. By 2010, you're still going to be working with a PlayStation 3. Of it. And they're going to be the people who can figure out what to do with 100x the hardware power. Are you up for this challenge? Almost 200 colleges and schools have courses on developing video games. Check the internet for more information. Next issue, we'll look at another way people get their foot in the door of the video game industry, through the test department. Oh yeah, that's a gateway in. <laughs> Quality assurance. New at PlayStation.com. No, I can't, uh... There's nothing to click on. Oh, it's just a, um... Discussion forum. Because <laughs> those things are fun. Credits, on tour, nothing there. All right. Quickly, girl, before it collapses around you. When we last saw Lara Croft in the hit Tomb Raider series, it seemed like the end had come for the popular heroine. She had a, a very, very near scrape with death in, uh, at the end of the last revelation. The temple collapsed around her and her body's been missing, presumed dead, so... We wanted to, to leave uh, the viewing public on a sort of cliffhanger. Uh, did she die? Didn't she die? And us saying that she was lost, presumed dead, was, was a way for us to sort of get Laura to refocus on her own life, you know, look back into herself about her, her priorities, what's important. So, um, so needless to say, she is, uh, she is alive and well. And uh, she's going to be come out guns a blazing. Lara returns in Tomb Raider: The Angel of Darkness, which continues from the end of the last Tomb Raider game. But we've just started off as Lara's been taken to Paris. She got called from Von Croy, and she finds him dead, and she's suddenly framed with murder. And she's on the run from the French police, and there's a whole new scenario instead of the usual Tomb Raider thing. And very soon, everything that's been there for Laura, being famous, you know, people recognizing her, being this face around the world, it all works against her because suddenly everybody wants to catch her. She's trying to go through and investigate who actually did kill Von Croy. That sort of leads her into a much deeper storyline. It's not just a crazed psychopath, it's a 15th century alchemist who's doing these ritual killings to rule the world and she's got to clear her name by destroying him.
As Lara sets out to find Von Croy's killer, she finds that her ordeals have weakened her and that she needs to build up her strength and skills again. She was really weakened um, at the tomb in Egypt. So it's, it's the story of her sort of returning as a, as a character, giving her the, the abilities that she once had uh, and then lost. We shall have an ability to improve her upper body strength or lower body strength. So as the game progresses, you'll find that she can perform longer jumps or she can hang on to monkey swings longer and go over past. Yeah, so they're making a lot out of what have ended up being a shitty mechanic. Be a different Lara to my Lara. I maybe just been to run a little bit faster with Lara and I can get to that door that's always shutting, whereas you haven't quite honed those skills and can't get to that door, but you might be able to climb better than me, so you can go around that corner and drop down the courtyard that I can't get to. We've also added more moves. She can do proper stealth moves now. She's got a lot of hand-to-hand -hand combat in there, punching, kicking. Um, she can sneak around corners. She can take enemies out and then sort of hide again. Part of what allowed the core team to develop these new moves for Lara was the power of the PlayStation 2. They further tapped this potential to develop a host of other improvements that will push Lara's adventures to the next level. Everything just goes up to a new level that nobody will have seen before because we're allowed to do so much more with the PS2. Lara's 8,000 polygons, PS1 version, she was 600. So we've been able to add a, a whole new dimension of detail to her. She, she will actually lip sync when she talks to characters. They'll actually, you know, have full facial expressions and lip sync back, back at Lara. <laughs> this Tomb Raider game is a lot darker than previous games, as in the storyline is much more sinister. So the mood and the atmosphere is, is something um, that we've been very keen to create. I think that lends itself to the lighting system. So we've, we've tried to beef up the lighting a lot by adding the shadow maps. In certain areas, we've got really very realistic um, shadows casting across the floor from objects, from Lara, other enemy characters, everything casts shadows onto everything. It makes a hell of a difference. As Lara struggles to determine what's happened to Von Croy, she runs into a new character in the Tomb Raider series, a character who's an integral part of the game. His name is Curtis, and uh, he is the coolest character ever. He's uh, a member of Was he? an ancient <laughs> is he really? <laughs> set of knights called Deluxe Veritatis. They've sort of got uh, paranormal powers, and basically he's a demon hunter. We wanted Curtis to be quite a different character to Lara. Um, it's going to be quite an interesting sort of love-hate relationship that they have initially because Curtis is there in this game and, and he's always one step ahead of Lara. He's, he's almost like the thorn on her side. He seems to be on his own mission, has his own agenda, but he's always just there one, one stage ahead of her. So they don't like each other at all and it's not till later on in the game that they sort of get uh, to work as a team. I didn't play a whole lot of... Angel of Darkness. It wasn't very good. One of the hallmarks of the Tomb Raider series has always been the creative use of puzzles in the game, and Angel of Darkness is no exception. And as we have looked at what people have enjoyed playing in Tomb Raider, it has actually been that sort of hard-edged puzzles. It's been that standing there, knowing where you've got to go, but trying to work out how to solve that puzzle. Also, we've got those sudden death sort of things where if you just don't get it right, she begins to fall, you know, you've got that timing just to grab that ledge or grab that precipice just before she plummets to her death. Tomb Raider, the Angel of Darkness, is the first part of a new story for Lara Croft, one that the game's creators have already mapped out. The story within this game doesn't end within this game. And, and this is very much, a, 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 you know, the first few chapters of the book, if you like. There's a lot of unanswered questions that we've already planned for, for future titles. It sounds like the team at CORE have plenty of adventures in store for us in the future. Be sure to check out the start of this new era for Lara Croft when Tomb Raider The Angel of Darkness hits stores late April. <laughs> So, uh, that game sucked. 
It was supposed to be the start of like a new storyline for Lara Croft, but it ended up bombing so hard that it all of that was abandoned. And the whole Tomb Raider series sort of went dark for a few years until Le Legend, Legend came out. And that was like an early 360 late PS2 game kind of thing, which more or less just rebooted the entire series. So there's actually been three different Lara Croft series. The original, which like the original game up through Angel of Darkness. And this was the last time we saw the original version of Lara Croft. Then there was the legend Lara Croft, which was the three three games that uh, oh god, what are the names? There was the, the remake of the original game, but with the remake version of Lara, the rebooted version of Lara in it. And there's a third one. Something. And then they rebooted Tomb Raider again about 10 years ago with that, uh, that Square Enix version of Lara Croft which I'm guessing, since it's been a few years since the last time we've seen one of those, I'm guessing that that, um, that, that series has concluded as well. Because it seemed like something that they'd want to churn out one every three years or so, and it's been a few, so I think we're not, I think that one's over with. Crystal Dynamics was sold from, by Square Enix to Embracer, I think. So it's possible that they just started their own, like all of the old, all of the old Crystal games, Tomb Raider, Legacy of Cain, whatever, Gex maybe, they're probably working on their own versions of them. Anyway, this was the last original Tomb Raider game, and I think it was probably um, core design, the developer struggled to get a handle on the PS2 hardware, which was probably the issue. A lot of developers had problems with the PS2 back when that thing, in the early days. Oh good, a motocross game. Oh, not even motocross, this is freaking BMX. I had talked at length in the past about how um, the PS1 and the, the, and the, the PS2 were definitely a golden age for these games, uh, like sort of limited market games. Because game of development has always been in a track of track of getting more and more expensive. Because the more powerful the hardware, the more detail you can put in the game, the more effort you have to put in to create that detail. So even though games were easier to develop for like um, the NES and the Welcome SNES and stuff like that. The cost of distribution was just too high because the manufacturing of the cartridges was expensive. But distributing these things on discs made distribution a lot cheaper. Something like less than 10% the price. So you could make these games like if you... If you made a game with the idea that it would at best sell 100,000 copies, you could do it in that area because the cost wasn't so high to make it not worth it and distribution was so low that you could financially justify it. So you got BMX games. You got this little skateboarding game that no one's ever going to play called Tony Hawk. There was a lot of stuff like that happening. Basically a head-to-head type of a race, man-made course, big jumps, big berms. When you got into the PS3, 360 era, I think this kind of thing largely died off because the cost of developing things got so much more expensive. And then it sort of reignited later once digital distribution came uh, became more common because essentially the cost of manufacturing the discs disappeared completely because it's all just done over the internet. And of course, like... Xbox Live Arcade and um, PlayStation Network, Steam, and all those, they're going to take their cut of the profits as well, but 
the cost of distribution is uh, otherwise physical media production shipping at the stores all that kind of stuff just is gone so you'll seeing you're seeing stuff particularly in the indie space of this kind of thing now but there really isn't any it isn't like the same anymore because you don't have these um, legit studios going and producing these let's call it a high quality game that's on the sort of the bleeding edge of technology anymore because the market's just not big enough for it modern game budgets have ballooned to crazy levels used to be something like oh well uh, like they said before like earlier in the video a 10 million dollar project during that uh, 10 million dollar game project that was a lot of money back then now games like, oh, well, like, well, I'm making a AAA game, well, what's your budget? Oh, well, I gotta put, I gotta script together $50 million for this thing. $50 million and it's gonna take five years, 60 million. Some people have said that uh, the Destiny series was going to take um, 500 million. Of course, that, that number is a little bit out of context, I think, but still, like, the, the idea is not as absurd as it sounds. Something like this, this game, uh, you know, I don't want to, I don't really know, but let's just say that this game would have had a budget of at least a million. If you were to get a game like this on Steam, where they go and they using modern development we tools, distributing on Steam. Um, like if that, that game's probably gonna be an indie project where somebody just like put it together in their bedroom or it's gonna be a small dev team of like five to 10 people or something like that. And honestly, the most expensive thing is about that's probably gonna be licensing the technology. You're both gonna go down. We've got tons of wildlife, moose, cow, bears, all these things that come surprise Of course there is a difference with the way the, the PlayStation 2 was a quirky but powerful machine in its day. But in order to get it to look really good, you really did kind of have to go all out in terms of your programming budget and, and time and all that kind of stuff to really tweak the game and the coax the most powerful, uh, the high level performance out of it. So, like, the PlayStation 2 didn't have a whole lot of memory available to, for textures. Something like 4 megabytes of video RAM was available for it. So it's going to be like, well, you're talking about frame buffer and you're talking about um, texture memory and all that kind of stuff. So that's not a lot. So how do you get high quality, like, environment textures and all that? Well, there are ways to do it. Texture streaming off the disc and this and that and all this other kind of stuff. But that takes effort. You got to design your technology around it. You got to design your game around it and all that kind of stuff. Whereas modern hardware is so much more powerful and the game engines have become so easy to use, you don't need that same level of expertise in order to churn out something that looks decent enough. Like, if you wanted to make a PC game that looked like this, you would honestly, like, you probably couldn't even do it because you'd the game would just run at a higher resolution. I'm actually and you wouldn't... Consulting and designing if you were to even target hardware that was released 10 years ago, it would be so easy to... You, it would just be a matter of asset creation. You wouldn't have to sit there and tweak performance profiles and all that kind of stuff to make it run as efficiently as possible. I didn't want to stop. I mean, that's just like when you're doing a downhill run and you're having a really killer downhill run, you don't want to stop. And I was starting to get really into it. And by the end of it, my thumbs were starting to hurt. Now that the pros have mastered downhill domination, let's see if the game developers Downhill domination. No All right. <laughs> Wakeboarding Unleashed, featuring Sean Murray, another example. All the same crap I said about the previous game is true here. Of course, everybody was chasing after the Tony Hawk success. 
He had always had, or for a long time anyway, had these games that were focused on these sort of like extreme sports. That's what we called that. Um, this extreme sports markets. Game, so, like, back in the NES and, like, the C64 and all that kind of stuff, the they, there was a game called like California Games, where it was like, oh, well, there's skateboarding, there's snowboarding, there was even, like, hacky sack. If you want to make a weird, sports game, weird collection of games. Involved early in the game's development. So of course, it had its own at measure of popularity, but... And we'll give them the a whole mixture of games, but there was only so much of a market for that kind of thing. And you had, like... Eventually, you saw Tony Hawk come out. Well, even before Tony Hawk, you had, like, ESPN Extreme for the PlayStation 1, and then, like, 2 Extreme and 3 Extreme and all those games that came after it. You had, like, 1080 snowboarding. And all that stuff had limited appeal. But, like, you didn't need to. Then Tony Hawk comes around. Oh, my God, Tony Hawk managed to cross the threshold from being niche market to being mainstream. And really, it just sort of... There was a few reasons for it, I think. The... We got every like, wakeboard no. trick in the world. Tony Hawk uh, was... Really if anybody cool had been, ever been able to name any pro skateboarder, up, it was going to be Tony Hawk. To copy. You know, you see it in the game so you had a name attached to it. It's not exactly the most charismatic guy in the world, but he does his job. That they've invented on there. And, and then you had what was good, like addictive, you know addictive gameplay. And then the soundtrack. Man, the soundtrack for Tony Hawk was, like, such a huge part of it. If that game was re-released now without the soundtrack, you wouldn't want to play it, I think. It was so, well, I mean, it was a product of its time, of course, like all popular music is, but it, it definitely struck a chord with people. So, Tony Hawk comes around, and it is not just a niche success, it is a freaking mainstream huge success. And then everybody's like, oh, well, we're going to get uh, this like go snowboarding game with insert snowboarding guy name. We're going to get this um, surfing game water. with insert surfing guy name. Me, like, we're we're going to get this wake, downhill when it really came together, was, skiing when with just downhill to skiing guy, guy name. And go off on the side. <laughs> as... <laughs> I mean, they're definitely the looking for Tony Hawk levels of success, sport, but I don't think anybody achieved it. In the, game. the Pro Tour, we only have, you know, about... 10 to 15 girls Look at the water effects that, that they have. They have the wake coming off the back of the boat. To grow that is grass. definitely in something way, so of a to the um, sports. Skateboarding and snowboarding, something of a PlayStation 2 hallmark in some ways. Really you know how you always long. have these... You look at graphics of a game and you can sometimes tell just by the way certain effects look or the way they work of what console it was released for. Those kinds of water effects, that's definitely a PlayStation 2 looking thing. The same kind of thing that, like, yeah, there's better looking, like, the, the Xbox, uh, the original Xbox, would do uh, water effects like that, but would do them differently. They wouldn't, like, tend to model geometry in the same way, whatever. Is this Hi, dude's giving us tips and tricks? I'll be showing you a cool move for Sly Cooper. It's a short Sly to Cooper. The time trial to open up the bonus commentary. The QA people. Huh. Okay, this shortcut is for the Dread Swamp Path. Something I've said over and over again was, was that if you were into platformers at the time, like. Sly Cooper, Jack and, and Daxter, uh, Ratchet Clank, that kind of, of that kind of game. The place that you should have been on is the PlayStation 2. You had Nintendo, which had really sort of mastered the platformer in the previous generation with Mario 64, Banjo and Kazooie, that kind of thing. But during the this generation, it was the PS2 that really came out on top. I feel like. If you bounce. I think out of the three, uh, the title, PlayStation titles I mentioned, Sly Cooper is probably the most forgettable of them. Even then, though, it was still a great game. I didn't, uh, I honestly didn't spend a lot of time with it. 
but I'm still capable of recognizing what it was. It's funny how that had happened. I think it just came down to, like, technological issues. The PlayStation 1 with its, like, its controller without an analog stick initially just wasn't that well designed for platformers. And the technology of the machine, like, it did struggle at times to create, like, 3D environments. So you saw, like, okay, Tomb Raider, Tomb Raider 3D environment. There's but the platforming like was, it was a very so slow plotting kind of platforming. You had Crash Bandicoot, yeah, sure, Crash Bandicoot's great. But it had a fixed uh, camera really perspective as it moved down, and that made controlling it a little bit difficult. Spyro the Dragon, sure, you can call that a platform if you want, but there's not a lot of platforming to it. The, uh, the PlayStation 2 removed all those technical constraints, and all those developers that had a hard time really... Um, Getting the PS1 to do what they needed to do to be good for platforming, well, that wasn't an issue anymore, and the PS2 really became a time to shine for platforming. This game, I don't know what this is. I've never played this before. Knock him back. Keep running around. Make sure you stay in front of him while he's coming at you. And you keep doing missile shot after missile shot. Huh. And locking on. Is this just to defeat a boss? Don't let him get close to you. Whatever you do, otherwise he'll kick you and throw you against the back wall. And you lock on again. One more missile shot. And he's down to nothing, so you can do the death blow. And he's out. So is this defeating a boss? See, I know what they're trying to do here with these tips and tricks. But these games would oftentimes... Oh, it's not done yet. By the time a lot of these games came out, if you, like, defeating a boss, people probably had figured out. If it's going to be some little, like, secret area to the side that people aren't really going to notice... Sure, go ahead and show this kind of stuff, but just beating a boss... So make sure to go buy yourself a copy of Gungrave and get to Boonji, whoop him, and have fun with the game. Shut your mouth. Wrestling all over the know your role and shut your mouth. Punks, nothing but punks. If you want to learn how to wrestle with a heartburn kid, listen up and pay attention. Oh my God! Look at that thing. First thing you want to do is make sure that you've got power attack moves and special attack moves. These stun your opponent so you can throw another move on him right after which. Kind of creating a combo system if you can understand that. Okay. You're just showing us how to do a creative like wrestling? That leaves you right at the feet of the opponent. So the wrestling games really sort of pioneered the create a character kind of thing. Whereas you did have, like, um, you did have RPGs, which allowed you to create your character, but you didn't, you couldn't, in, the, in that time, sort of create their appearance and really customize their moves the way that you could in the wrestling games. And it's the SmackDown games that people, like, largely think about when it comes to create a wrestler moves, but it was actually WWF uh, now all you what, do is turn around and get him. Um, Warzone, I think it was called. Electric chair drop is really a, um, a wrestling game for the PS1 and the N64, stand up, turn which around, had the first version of Creative Wrestler in it. And it was really simplistic. You only had Same a few different things that you could Leave pick. You, right head, you, you could just, around, and then you could pick their music that they came out during, and you could pick their move set. Now, by picking their moon set, move set. You weren't when choosing the moves the like this guy is doing sure here. What you did use is pick a already made wrestler. To drop his meter down. And then you go and like take their entire move set. So it's like if you wanted if you uh, you could pick Triple H's move set. So it's like, oh well he's table. gonna go out there and he's gonna do the triple H moves so and he's gonna do a pedigree you. and you can't customize that at all. And if you wanted to do like a stunner, you'd have to pick Austin's move really set, like but then you couldn't do a pedigree where you couldn't do any of Triple H's other moves. 
eventually, once we got to the SmackDown series, which was still a the PS most game, attack in this whole game is making sure and the um, and WrestleMania 2000 attack. and No Mercy, the Create a Wrestler game, suite had, anything, had really in, in a, him, only a few years really out. exploded in terms of not just popularity, it had become right a much move. more fleshed out experience because you could do what we're doing here, pick individual moves to apply to your wrestler. Uh, go really in depth in detail with their designs. Like, look at the weird shit that this person put on this guy, and all of the like the mix and match of moves that you just like to see, and all that kind of stuff. I have not played a WWE game in since like maybe 2016. They had really started to suck. <laughs> And they really started to suck long before now, I stopped playing them. Just make sure you're not an Maybe they're better now. I don't know. Not to give them some kind of submission moves, but you see this kind of thing a lot in other games now. Like some the UFC games. You can create game. your own fighter there. All right, Beanhead. Oh, dude. All the Calm down. Stop, uh, stop pointing you know, at me like the Moxie man. I know. Just uh, when you think you know the answers, I'm changing the questions. Lessons he wants you for the U.S. Army. my luggage and get out of the car. I'm going to hurry. You got a uh, creative. Oh, that's all it was. Creative superstar wrestler. People are gonna figure that out. It really did become part of a major selling feature. Like I remember getting one of the later PS2 SmackDown games, and I remember when I got it home. As soon as I popped it in, the first thing I did before I played any matches, anything, was to jump in the creative wrestler. Because it was, it became like the most important part of it. Star Wars. Hi, I'm Lee Froman. I'm from Format QA, and I'll be showing you how to achieve the bonus objectives in the first few missions of Star Everybody Wars. Everyone loves Clone their Wars. Tiger Woods PGA 2003. Or is this the Master same guy? <laughs> I've received the coordinates for the first anti-orbital cannon. We must move quickly. Are we driving? Okay, one of the first skills you want to learn to master in this game is the R1 zoom or sniper shot. That will help you dispatch enemies. I'd say if there was ever a game, a movie series, or work of fiction that was well suited for video games, it was Star Wars. Just though, I mean, maybe maybe there wasn't really anything intrinsically better about the the fiction, the world of it, or anything like that. But you saw so many good games. Now I don't really give a shit too much of a shit about like uh, Super Star Wars or like the old SNES games. For I didn't really give a shit about Star Wars games until you started seeing games like um, Rogue Squadron. I guess maybe Shadows of the Empire was in its day felt like groundbreaking and all that stuff but that game actually sucked it was sucked at the time i, I remember th thinking it was frustrating and everything but rogue squadron which is a flight game then you had rogue squadron was an n64 game then you had jedi starfighter for uh for the ps2 knights of the old republic for pc and xbox these games really went and turned the uh, you can still demonstrated how good the Star Wars franchise was for video games. So don't be afraid to um, go ahead and Jedi Knight, while you zoomed in on uh, Dark the Dark Forces, the leader Dark the Forces games like Jedi Knight and Jedi Academy were other examples of this. Just great foundation to make good games. In fact, I would say I was never a particularly big okay, fan so of the Star Wars the the movies. Installation, you'll notice on the right, sure, the like the original Star Wars is, is good, and I think Empire Strikes top, Back is better. This will be your first R5 Disliked, the uh, I didn't, didn't like of the three. Once you um, find Ren him, Return of the Jedi as much. The edge, prequels, right down uh, big sequels, uh, what was that? Rogue Squad? Rogue, uh, Rogue One. I'm like, eh, yeah, all right, but nah. And the first ramp of this so really, like, <laughs> more to pick up, so you can go ahead and there are only actually two Star Wars movies out of ten. Do. Eleven. Eleven. There's fucking eleven. There's a stupid Han Solo movie. Out of eleven movies, I think there are only two of them that I can actually sit down and just enjoy, you know? So I'm not a particularly big fan of Star Wars as a whole. 
So, to me, in some cannon, to some level, Star Wars is more a turbo world where quality games can exist in. Doesn't mean all Star Wars games are good, but it some of the best games I can think of came from Star Wars. This I've never heard of. This is like a weird car combat game. It's like you know, let's take uh, let's take Twisted Metal and uh, make it Star Wars, which is actually something they did. What was that stupid ass game called? Uh, it was a PS1 game. It's a PS2 game. This is something different. This is like we're on a mission or something here. But like, it's Star Wars. I don't want to be hovering around on the ground shooting lasers. Give me a spaceship. Give me a lightsaber. One of those two things. I need a spaceship or I need a lightsaber. Don't fuck around with anything else. Or maybe a jetpack. I don't know. Get me in the sky, or give me a lightsaber. Canyon here, you're gonna start running into the hula hoop tanks that shoot all the rockets. Hula hoop tanks. <laughs> you want to edge up on the left-hand side here, and you'll run up to this rock formation. This is where you're gonna find your second R5 unit, and it's very important that you don't destroy all the enemies before you get that unit. Otherwise, the cutscene appears, and you don't get that. Second See, this R5 guy's unit. showing a secret. A secret in the game that you're probably not going to just discover on your own. So yeah, make a video about this. Don't make a video about create a wrestler. Or don't make a video about defeating one boss that people are probably going to be able to beat anyway. Bumper cars. The last anti-orbital cannon is housed in that outpost. Now after the cutscene, you'll be outside the tank. Oh, you'll be I have a lightsaber. You, you want to use your <laughs> Is that the attack button that's throwing? Oh God, what was Sam Jackson's uh, your character? Lightsaber. All right, uh, and you can angle at it. It's like a boomerang, so you can throw it in one I'm direction. Ah, uh, oh, fuck. Um, turn the other, and it'll work its way around. Whatever. So you can kill more enemies that way. All, all I know is he's sick of these motherfucking droids in this motherfucking um, desert planet. You know, I tell you what, this this few um, this few actors in the world nowadays that have the kind of charisma that Samuel L. Jackson has. Doesn't matter what the hell that guy is doing. That guy he's just freaking awesome. And like he he fucks around with it too. <laughs> like there was some I'd seen a it was like a commercial or maybe it just like a, a video or something that he had, had complete sign. Where he's walking around and in public, and people are coming up to him and saying like, "Oh, I saw this movie," and like, "And your movie like did something that ruined your life or something like that." Or five unit. So now all we have to do is just hurry up and end this mission by destroying the last. Something about like his uh, his influence in his movies went and and ruined their kids' lives or got him arrested or something like that. I forget the details, so I shouldn't have brought it up. If you find yourself stuck and you don't have enough kills, the ship will keep dropping Genotians. You can go ahead and just keep counting away at them <laughs> until you get your 100 kills. That takes care and that's it. You've got everything. Yeah, this does not look as good as, um, as like, Jedi Outcast. Jedi Outcast okay, was a game so a for PC, and I think there might have been an Xbox version the where you were playing as the Turbo and the Strafe. They're all very key <sighs> fucking to being guy. All the I don't know. In this game. And it's not uh, it's not Sam Jackson, that's for sure. Are, and, you've seen how to, and the game was great once you got your quick. lightsaber, don't but until you got the lightsaber, it was just sort of a weird, goofy first-person shooter that I didn't much care for. And it was a little bit frustrating because the level design was ass. And then you got your lightsaber. Saber and like you're deflecting laser bolt blasts and on shit like that. It was just, it was awesome. But then they, what the fuck? Oh shit! That just saved something to the memory card. Uh, these are just saves. All right, I guess that's it. That's it. Okay. There we go. That's the end of uh, official U.S. PlayStation Magazine demo disc for issue number 70. How long was that? 45 minutes. Fuck. It was just a video portion.